Following on from the end of the First Scottish War of Independence, during which the forces of William Wallace mounted an initially successful but ultimately fruitless campaign against the English, an uneasy peace between the two nations was declared from 1306, following the crowning of Robert the Bruce as King of Scotland. However, the Scottish monarch's own ambitions would soon see the two countries once again at war, ultimately leading to one of the most famous battles in British history. In the First Scottish War of Independence, during which large swathes of the country had been captured and ruled under a puppet government that answered to the English monarch, Robert Bruce, Earl of Carrick, and now 7th Lord of Annandale, had originally been one of Edward's fiercest opponents during the guerrilla campaign led against the English under William Wallace. During this conflict, it became apparent to Robert that the Scots were unable to successfully confront the English in open warfare without the conditions of the battlefield being firmly in their favour, and towards the end of the conflict, he began, from a mixture of necessity and self-preservation, to take sides with the southern invaders. Seeing little hope of unseating the English following their successful conquest of the Highlands and Lowlands, but was prepared to play a waiting game, especially as Edward was now well into his sixties. Bruce, who held large swathes of property across the nation, and also having a claim to the throne of Scotland, was viewed by Edward as not entirely trustworthy, much of the suspicion coming from a pact made between Bruce and William Lamberton, the Bishop of St Andrews, who was one of the guardians of Scotland during the First Scottish War of Independence, alongside Bruce himself and John Common III of Badenoch, Lamberton having been appointed as neutral guardian in order to keep the peace between Bruce and Common, who refused to agree on anything. The secret pact made with Lamberton being that should Bruce ally himself with the English, he would surrender a sum of £10,000, a figure that comprised a vast majority of his estates, while the pact also meant that Bruce was covertly honour-bound to maintain the perseverance of Scotland against the English. Bruce held a meeting with Common, his rival for the Scottish throne, where he agreed that in exchange for supporting Bruce's own claim, Common would receive Bruce's lands and compensation. However, before this could come to pass, Common betrayed the details of both the conference and the pact to Edward, leaving Bruce, who was in the English court at the time, no choice but to flee after being forewarned of his impending arrest. Enraged at Common's treachery, on February 6, 1306, Bruce confronted his betrayer at Greyfriars Church, during which he drew his dagger and non-fatally stabbed Common before escaping, while his attendants, Roger de Kirkpatrick and Alexander Lindsay, entered the church and finished off Common. Bruce now found himself a fugitive from English justice, while for the murder of Common, he faced the possibility of becoming an excommunicate, his only defence being his pact with Lamberton, in which he could justify the murder as protecting Scotland from a traitor. Robert Bruce then met with the Bishop of Glasgow, Robert Wishart, who absolved him from the crime, cementing the support from the Scottish Church despite papal discreet, and backed his claim for the crown. Only seven weeks later, at Scone Abbey on March 25, 1306, Robert Bruce was crowned as King Robert I of Scotland, immediately launching a new campaign to free his country from English rule. Initially, this fighting for independence was not successful, with his defeat at the Battle of Methven later that year seeing him driven from the Scottish mainland as an outlaw, while his wife, three of his brothers, his sisters and daughter were captured by the English, with his brothers hanged, drawn and quartered. In 1307, shortly after King Edward I's passing on July 6th of the same year, Bruce returned from hiding, while Edward II, the son of Edward I, remembered fondly as the Hammer of the Scots, ascended to the English throne, Edward II being faced by many difficulties early in his reign due to the vying priorities of individual noblemen, who had to be kept in line through considerable military and political acumen, something the young Edward was ill-equipped to face in the manner of his illustrious father. This led to his rule being blighted by simmering disputes, that often broke into open conflict between the monarch and his nobles. Symbolic of this was Edward II's reliance upon his favourite, Piers Gaveston, a Gascon knight whom Edward had made the Earl of Cornwall, and was a much-hated figure by most of the senior nobility of England. Rejoicing at the death of Edward I, Bruce, immediately seeing the weakness of the new king, reignited his campaign to drive the English from his land, though the invaders had taken steps to reinforce their control over Scotland during the previous decade of their occupation, their main weapon being heavily defended stone castles that dominated the surrounding countryside, supported by garrisons of small groups of armed knights and men. The chief weaknesses of these fortresses, however, was their day-to-day -day security. King Robert, much like William Wallace before him, being better suited to the role of guerrilla warfare rather than pitched battle, and thus used this strength to his advantage when overcoming the English castles, his men becoming masters of the art of taking fortifications by trick and surprise. The main weapon for the Scots when taking castles was the humble scaling ladder, 
which could be rapidly assembled and easily undetected due to the lack of English soldiers available to guard the entire length of the wall, with Scottish knights climbing the wall undetected and thus penetrating the fortress before any alarm could be raised, by which time it was too late to repel the inevitable capture. One of the more famous examples of this Scottish tactic was the capture of Edinburgh Castle on March 14, 1313 by Randolph, Earl of Moray, where during the climb up the ladders against the castle wall, the English watch actually looked over the wall at the point where the Scots were preparing to attack, before loudly moving on, leaving the Scots to scale the wall and open the gate to the waiting force, which then stormed the castle. Another notable instance was the taking of Linlithgow Castle by William Bannock in September 1313 where Bannock drove up in a cart filled with fodder for the garrison's horses and stopped the cart in the gateway, thereby preventing the garrison from closing it, followed by his knights leaping from beneath the fodder and assisted by a band of men that rushed the gate, successfully storming the castle. Bruce's campaign worked well, with each town and castle captured, having its fortifications torn down so as to prevent reuse by the English in the event it was retaken, eventually leading to nearly all of the fortresses in Scotland being unusable by the English to dominate the local region, Stirling Castle being one of the last still in English hands, which was held for Edward II by Sir Philip de Mowbray. This castle was besieged from February 1313 by King Robert's brother Edward Bruce, which continued until June, at which point de Mowbray put an offer to Bruce, stating that if Stirling Castle was not relieved by Midsummer's Day of the next year, or June 24, 1314, de Mowbray would surrender the castle to Bruce. In order to comply with this requirement, the relieving English army would also need to be within three miles of the castle within eight days of that date. Bruce accepted this offer without a full appraisal of the potential consequences, while his brother, clearly conscious of the deception, knew that such a rash agreement would invite Edward II to launch a new invasion of Scotland. At the end of 1313, Edward issued the summons for his army to assemble, enlisting men under the pretense that this mission was simply to relieve Stirling Castle while the real objective was to reconquer Scotland, the shaky hold Edward II maintained over his nobility being illustrated by the number of powerful noblemen who refused to answer the call to arms, these including the Earl of Lancaster, the Earl of Warwick, the Earl of Warren, and the Earl of Arundel among others, though many nobles did come to aid their monarch, including Henry de Bowen, Earl of Hereford and Constable of England, the Earl of Gloucester, and the Earl of Pembroke, together with the Scottish Earl of Angus. Edward's army also comprised of many famous knights, who came from as far afield as France, Gascony, Germany, Flanders, Brittany, Aquitaine, Gilders, Bohemia, Holland, Zealand, and Brabant, with foot soldiers arriving from across England and archers from Wales. Assembling at Berwick in May 1314, Edward's army marched forward into Scotland on June 17th, this fighting force stretching for many miles and moving slowly due to the huge quantities of sheep and cattle to provide rations for the men and carts carrying the baggage of the members of the army and the quantities of fodder required for the knights' heavy fighting horses. The army, confident in their victory over the Scots, moving first to Edinburgh, before taking the old Roman road to Stirling, past Falkirk, and then heading through the forest of Torwood and across the Bannockburn stream, an area constrained by thick mudland and the presence of the tidal river Forth along the northern flank. Meanwhile, King Robert assembled his own army of Scottish foot soldiers to the south of Stirling, forming them into four battalions commanded by himself, Thomas Randolph, Earl of Moray, James Douglas, and his brother Edward Bruce. Supported by various Highland clans, as commanded by their clan chiefs, Bruce positioned his army in the new park, digging concealed pits across the front of their position and along the bank of the Bannock Burn to break up any mounted charge against them. Following his delayed departure from Berwick, and in order to meet the Midsummer's Day deadline, Edward's army was forced to make up lost time, with the men having to march some 20 miles on June 22nd alone the English army now being encamped in the fields south of Bannockburn, being formed in ten divisions that were each led by a senior nobleman or experienced knight. The following day, the army commenced its final march up to the Bannockburn, where the king was met by Sir Philip de Mowbray and a body of horsemen who had ridden out from Stirling Castle, Sir Philip pleading with Edward to abandon the battle due to the unfavourable circumstances of the terrain and the fighting force presented by King Robert, though the headstrong nobles and knights, led by the English monarch, refused to believe his words. Unable to persuade Edward, 300 horsemen under Sir Robert Clifford and Henry de Beaumont rode back to Stirling Castle with de Mowbray to reinforce the garrison, passing under the nose of Randolph, Earl of Moray, who was severely rebuked by King Robert for allowing the enemy to pass his soldiers by uncontested. Randolph, therefore, rushed his foot soldiers down to the path, 
to block the route of Clifford and de Beaumont's force, leading to a savage battle as the English horsemen tried vainly to penetrate the Scottish formation. At the same time, Douglas moved his men forward to provide support, and soon the English were put to flight, half of the survivors riding for the castle, and the remainder returning to the main army. This initial action took place as the main English army moved out of the Tor Wood, with the advance guard and the earls of Hereford and Gloucester riding to cross the Bannock Burn and attack the Scots in the forest beyond, their thinking being that the Scots would undoubtedly withdraw so as to avoid battle with such an enormous English army. The overconfidence of the English being embodied by the action of Hereford's nephew, Sir Henry de Bourne, who rode ahead to the front of the Scottish army and challenged King Robert to single combat, Robert accepting and riding forward to meet the challenge. Despite him being armed with a sword and a short axe, as compared to de Bohun's lance and shield, the Scottish king was able to administer a blow to the head with his axe as he evaded de Bohun's lance point, sending the English knight collapsing to the ground dead. Robert's triumph invigorated the Scots' army, and they charged upon the English as they struggled to clear the Bannock Burn, where the ford had compelled the mass of horsemen to pack into a narrow column, thus resulting in a violent slaughter as the English knights were unable to escape the shallow pits concealed with branches, the survivors being put into retreat, while the Scots returned to their positions in the new park. With the Scots having thoroughly defeated the English on the first day, King Robert assessed the potential strategies for the future of this new war with the invaders, considering that the Scots army, as in the previous war, should withdraw from the field and drag the English army across Scotland, while at the same time attacking their exposed supply chains, thus making them easier to ultimately defeat when driven too far from the border. His commanders thought otherwise though, feeling that the time to destroy the English army was now upon the field of Bannockburn, the possibility of victory being reinforced when Scottish knight Sir Alexander Seaton defected from the English to the Scottish side, advising Robert that morale in Edward's army was very low, and that securing victory in the morning could be easily undertaken with few losses on the Scottish side. The situation in the English camp deteriorated quickly, with word among the soldiers being that their conquest of Scotland was unholy and that God was using supernatural powers to ensure their defeat, leading to a breakdown in order that saw English troops ransack the supply wagons and drink through the night. For the Scots, positioned north-south along the main road out of Stirling, their assault on the English would take place by crossing the Bannock Burn nearer to the River Forth to avoid the area of pits that had so hampered the enemy's advance. Meanwhile, the English crossed the Bannock Burn and formed up along the edge of the cars of Balkidarok in preparation for their charge, this position being less than ideal as their left flank lay on the Bannock Burn and their right was hemmed in by the Pell Stream, forcing far too many English soldiers into a narrow corridor. The Scots army of foot soldiers moved against the English mounted knights in a tactic that defied usual convention, though in spite of the expectation that the soldiers would be trampled, the knights' assault was countered by a wall of spears that proved fatal with the Earl of Gloucester, who led the charge, together with Sir Edmund de Morley, Sir John Common, Sir Pan de Tiptoff, and Sir Robert de Clifford, all falling victim. At this point, Randolph's and Douglas's men came upon the left flank and attacked the unengaged English cavalry, waiting to charge in support of the first line, with light horsemen dispersing the Welsh archers that briefly held down their advance with suppressive fire. The Scots laying into the exhausted and panicking English army, who began to fall back to the Bannock Burn with ever-increasing speed and confusion, the battle now clearly lost as the English line broke and all organisations shattered. The Earl of Pembroke seized King Edward's bridle and led him away from the field surrounded by the royal retainers and accompanied by Sir Giles de Argentan, who ensured the king was safely away from the Scots before returning to the battle, where he was ultimately killed, Edward being taken to the gates of Stirling Castle, where de Mowbray urged his monarch not to seek refuge inside, as he would inevitably be taken prisoner should the castle be forced to surrender to King Robert, Edward thus retiring around the battlefield and rode for the safety of Linlithgow. In the wake of the Battle of Bannock Burn, the estimated number of men killed included between 300 to 700 English mounted knights and men-at-arms, although some placed the death toll much higher at around 11,000 men, while the number of Scots killed is unknown, with only two knights reported as lost, but probably light in consideration of their huge tactical advantage. Only one sizable group of men, all foot soldiers, make good their escape to England, these being a force of Welsh spearmen who were kept together by their commander, Sir Maurice de Berkeley, so that the majority of them could reach Carlisle. Philip de Mowbray, good to his word, surrendered Stirling Castle to Robert on June 24th, who promptly had it razed to the ground to prevent its recapture by any future English force. 
The war against the English continued for years with Scots invasions of England and several counter invasions, with the town of Berwick, now English, changing hands multiple times, as well as there being an ultimately fruitless invasion of Ireland, as conducted by Robert Bruce's brother Edward, which sought to turn Irish chiefs against what was pitched to them as an Anglo Norman occupation, though in the end the Scots were unable to unseat the English lords, and Edward was ultimately killed during the final days of the campaign. Pope John XXII, acting on the English account, excommunicated King Robert and a number of prominent Scots clergy, and placed Scotland under an interdict, ultimately leading, in 1320, to the Declaration of Arbroath, that was signed in Arbroath Abbey under the seals of eight Scottish earls, and was dispatched to Rome, containing a statement of the origins of the Scottish people and a declaration of their independence from the English. The Pope, accepting the veracity of the declaration, rescinding the excommunication and interdiction, thereafter addressing Robert with his official royal title as King of Scotland. The unofficial Scottish anthem, Flower of Scotland, being written to honour the success of King Robert at the Battle of Bannockburn. Following his failure to defeat the Scots, and the general unpopularity of his reign among the ruling classes of England, Edward II was eventually deposed by his nobles and senior clergy, following an invasion by the exiled Roger Mortimer, an English marcher lord who was assisted in his assault in 1326 by Edward's wife Isabella of France. Edward being forced to flee to Wales, whereupon he ultimately surrendered the throne on January 25, 1327, leading to the crowning of his 14-year-old son as Edward III, who would lead England through the early phases of the Hundred Years' War with France and be remembered as a highly successful, though often recklessly adventurous monarch. The new government in London then agreed to sign the Treaty of Edinburgh in March 1328, which would bring about an end to the long wars between England and Scotland, and was ratified by Edward III on May 4th of the same year. Edward II, after his removal from the English throne, being imprisoned in Berkeley Castle near Gloucester, and died nine months later on September 21st, 1327, of what were considered natural causes. A pervasive rumour being that the disgraced king was in fact murdered on the orders of the new regime, by the insertion of a red-hot poker, shrouded in a horn, into his posterior, though there is no firm evidence that Edward died in this terrible manner. In the end, the peace of England and Scotland would be a temporary one, as in the wake of King Robert's death on June 7, 1329, buying powers for control of the kingdom would lead the two nations into war yet again, bringing about the Second Scottish War of Independence that, through many defeats and victories, would pepper the next half-century in bloodshed.